your sprain and you ruled everything medical out, then I would work with your veterinarian and they might recommend either a veterinary behaviorist or another behaviorist to come and help you out because a lot of times um, you can try feel away and you can try all of the things we've talked about in other videos, but unless you make sure there's no medical problem, you're not going to get anywhere. Right, and that's also, you say you say you're discussing behavior and everything. It's really helpful for your veterinarian if you actually take pictures of where the litter boxes are and of your general household because believe it or not we can actually figure out quite a bit of lack of environmental enrichment with these cats that act out inappropriately um, that they're quote unquote behaviorally marking territories it comes down to that it's not a medical problem we usually see that the litter boxes are in the wrong places or the litter boxes aren't big enough like in you know litter boxes should be one and a half times the length of your cat so if you have a pretty big cat and you're looking at like a sweater box you'll be using uh, for a litter box and also sticking the litter boxes in closets or hiding them in uh, the laundry room where it's really busy is not ideal as well but usually we can see we're like you're doing it completely wrong and this is why we have a problem and slight modifications can help like uh, we were discussing a couple weeks ago when we were talking about inappropriate elimination that I had to set a camera up to find my phantom pooper mm -hmm. in the house and all it was, was, it turned out to be Benny, which I'm horrified over. It's perfect. Benny can did, never did, do anything wrong. He can never do anything wrong. perfect in he every did, way. He, and he did majestic. something wrong, it was him. And here I was blaming Beeps the whole time. I'm like, Beeps, but she's like, it's not me. <laughs> all it turned out was he didn't like the litter box in one side of the room. He wanted it on the opposite side of the room near the window downstairs. In the well, downstairs clearly room. he wanted to look outside the window after he pooped right away. Right, and I haven't had any problems since. So it took a matter of tweaking and finding out what was going on. I have the appropriate number of litter boxes in my home and they're big and they're open and they don't have lids on them and I changed the litter religiously and it turned out to be, it was location. I mean, it's just like real estate, location, 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 right? It is. But oh, I feel like I just <laughs> made my father proud. <laughs> um, other things was um, obsessive compulsive disorder in cats. So, again, you have to rule out the medical stuff. So, is it really obsessive compulsive disorder? Do they have an allergy to something and it's not diagnosed? Oh, she didn't like the question. She tried to move it. Um, <laughs> is it that, like, is it, because whenever I think of someone with obsessive compulsive disorder, I always think that they have to turn the light switch on an X amount of time or like something like that. So then I picture a cat doing that with a light switch, um, which they don't usually do. Uh, so I, I think the main thing is I would wanna make sure that there's nothing medical going wrong. Are their electrolytes imbalanced? Um, do they have a bladder or a kidney stone? Are they in pain somewhere? To me, it sounds like it's probably a medical thing and, and you just have to do some digging. If it's not truly a medical thing, um, and you ruled everything out, you know, there's no pain, there's, when you do x-rays of the orthopedic, you know, you have to do orthopedic x-rays to rule things out like pain and stuff like that, um, then I would talk to a veterinary behaviorist because then they could probably help with different types of drugs um, that would help. The other thing you could do with some of these really bizarre behavior things that cats can do, you could get a holistic consult and go to a holistic clinic. And they there are acupuncture and whole um, herbs that can help with a lot of different types of holistic issues. This kitten is very intrigued <laughs> by what we're doing. It's pretty fun. I, I could watch What's her all day. He doesn't care. No, he doesn't even care. He's like, I don't care. I'm fine. Um, She's cute. like, I need more attention. Go that way. I'm a floopity floop. So we always get questions all the time on adventure cats and going outside and what is the best harness out there and I don't ask say it because my cats stay inside so this is all about Ellen. It's the original kitty holster uh, by Crazy K Farm. You can purchase it on Amazon, you can purchase it from their website but it is the original kitty holster. Um, you're going to get a kitty holster in a second on the floor if you don't die. Um, but those, that's what you need to use in order to start your adventures outdoors and start them off slow. Cats like slow adventures only because too much stimulation can cause anxiety. 
So we want we start off um, slow on that. And you can actually check out Adventure Cats on Instagram for tips on making your cat an adventure cat as well. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Are there any questions yet, Sarah? Yeah, there's a bunch, but I don't, I'm scared to scroll because I'm scared it's gonna, the iPad's gonna fall. Um, but there was one question about um, managing and treating key line herpes flare-ups. Mm. Um, so some people think that all this, the current studies show that lysine doesn't help. I think that lysine might help a little bit. Um, so I still use it, but a lot of people think that lysine doesn't help anymore. A lot of people like to use pancyclovir, but just like any other stress-related illness, herpes usually comes on during times of stress. It's important to try to mitigate their stress and use feel away and Zilkeen or Anzapain. Um, you could use stress or calm diet um, and just make sure their needs are being met. Uh, when you do have a flare-up, I would work with your veterinarian. They're probably going to want to use things like GenPak ointment and um, Famcyclovir to help reduce the symptoms. And you always want to make sure if it is a herpes flare-up that they're not going to have a secondary bacterial infection because that happens. Um, a lot of people are saying happy anniversary to Alan. Oh, thank you. Yes, it's my husband and I got married 20 years ago in um, Jamaica. Jamaica. Yep, we were actually Jamaican residents because <laughs> you have to be a resident to get married here. So we had to stay there several days before we actually got married, which we were so sunburned and everything else when we got married. And we're like, we're getting married. Oh, we're getting married in 30 minutes. And we had to run back to the hotel. <laughs> so to get ready. So yeah, but yeah, for um, 20 years. And somebody asked, um, is kennel cough transferable to cats? How do you introduce dogs to cats? That's two questions. I will say this. When I worked at the Washington Animal Rescue League um, back in the 90s, um, it is zoonotic. Um, you can have some issues with um, animals that transmit canine vorticella to cats. And we actually had a cat that we did on the Frothy and the Fingers Frothball. This was one of my kittens. He got very, very sick very, very quickly, and boy, did it come back with canine vorticella in its brain, as, as, as on his crash report. Yeah, so they can get it from dogs. It's not common, but it can happen. Also, some show cats get it, um, or cats in shelters. Um, and bunnies can get it. We call it snuffle or snufflers and bunnies. Uh, so I would say the first part of the question, you know, maybe try to limit your cat's exposure to dogs that have vorticella. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no reason to take a cat to like a bunch of dogs that have vorticella. It's not a good idea. And then second, um, maybe just try to make sure that any dog that comes into contact with your cat is as healthy as possible. Yep. Uh, in terms of introducing dogs to cats, I don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, with my dog, when we introduced her to our cats, my cat didn't really like her. And he just kind of whacked, no, it was Rocky. So he, Moose Rock, it's bad because their name were Moose and Rocky. So it was Bullwinkle and Rocky. They really should have been friends a little bit more than they were, but um, Moose just kind of batted at him. The best thing you can do is keep the dog on a leash or keep them in like a crate and let the cat walk around the main thing is the cats need to always have access to all their resources and they need to be able to run away to their resources and the resources need to be protected from the dog. So the dog should not have any access to their litter box or their food and water or their play stuff and always make sure cats have a way to get away. Yep. And another thing that's important if you do bring dogs near your cats, your cats really need to be on flea and heartworm prevention and parasite Oh yeah. Stop it, you two. I'm not gonna stop. There's a still a face mask. Seriously. Cute. <laughs> um, so we also had a question on. No, we don't. That's it. Bye. <laughs> Go down. What she do to you? She beat me while she was terrible. So we also had a question on um, when it comes to making a decision on quality of life. Like, how do you know when it's time to let go, or how do you know, or how do you make the decision whether or not to treat a disease, other than it being a personal decision? 
for a financial one, depending upon what you want to do. But how would you go about discussing that with the client that, you know, this is what we have going on, these are your options, and helping them make the correct decision? Well, first things first, you have to treat the patient, not the disease, right? So I wrote a blog not too long ago, you can check it out on our website, and it was like some decisions I had to make for my own cat because he tends to be a bit fearful when he comes to the clinic and he sounds like a velociraptor and would like to kill people. And because of that, I can't bring him in often. Um, so it sort of limits what we can do. Um, and you have to decide, and it's hard to make these decisions, isn't it, when you're looking at your pet and you're like, what would you do? What do you want? And the only person who really knows that is the person who lives with them the most. Now, the veterinarians and the technicians and the assistants can all help you understand the disease process so you know what's going to happen or what may happen. But you are the person who understands how much your pet can tolerate. Like, if your pet can't come to the vet clinic, then coming in a couple times a week for sub -Q fluids is impossible, but maybe you could get sub -Q fluids at home, you know, things like that. Um, so first you have to figure out what the patient needs, and then you need to figure out what the disease process is gonna look like and how you can impact that, and if that makes sense. Um, so for me, whenever I think about this with someone, I just, you know, I try to be upfront about the finances, because even though, um, especially when you're in hospice or you're trying palliative care, you know, that can matter. Like, is this really gonna buy us time? Is it fair to put the pet through this? Is it fair for me to work extra hours if it's really not gonna buy us a lot of time or quality time? Mm -hmm. You know, like for me, I'd rather have a really awesome couple weeks versus like a not so great couple years. That's how I feel personally. Um, I think that's how my cats feel, um, but that might not be how somebody else feels. Right. So you have to think about that. And then the, the thing I always say is think of the top five things that make your pet your pet. And when they're not doing that, that's when you think about time, unless there's an inciting cause or if there's more bad days than good days, that's when it's time. What do you usually say? Um, I usually do the more bad days versus good days and then um, the top five once you're past three, then it's probably time to make, you know, ultimately make a decision. And remember, it's, you know, kind of selfish on our part and that we want to keep them around. And we have to make sure that, you know, as responsible pet owners, um, our job is to protect um, our pets and our patients and to kind of say, you know, maybe I think you need to start thinking about you know, concluding with what's happening here. And then that it's okay to make those decisions. Um, everybody winds up having to make the decision every now and then, or you wind up with the circumstance of not being able to make that decision and you come home and the pet's have passed away um, on its own. So there's a whole bunch of scenarios, but yeah, I completely agree with yeah. what you say on that. Um, we have time for one more question because we have a special guest visiting us at one o'clock that we have to take pictures of because the kiwi pig is coming to visit. Sarah, are there any questions? No, none recently. Not recently. All right, well good. Anymore? Nope, we're gonna sign off because they're gonna be walking in the door any minute and we probably we're really take some excited. pictures. Um, so we will try to revisit this again next week. Yeah, and if there's a certain topic you want us to talk about or any other questions you have, just shoot them below and we'll try to get to them in our next talk. Thanks and have a great one. Peace.